Well, it's been quite a day at All Souls here today, um, because of course today, this morning, we had John Stott's funeral. And uh, the last week or so, not so much for me, but some of my colleagues at All Souls have been full of trying to organise it and, and get everything ready, and it went off perfectly. And uh, the building was full, uh, as one would have expected and hoped, but not too full so as to people had to be in overflows or anything like that, so that it all went very well indeed. And, and if, as one might expect, the service was full of uh, all that John Stott meant to so many of us, and of course many people who've known him far longer than I did uh, were there, as well as those uh, from the All Souls Church family who've uh, known him perhaps just more recently. The service was full of him, but far more significantly, it was full of the Lord Jesus, and that's exactly how he would have wanted. There, there was humour and joy, uh, as well as grief and sadness, and full of hope, knowing that he has enjoyed a great homecoming, and that was a thrill that uh, ran through the whole time together. I wrote on my blog uh, a few days ago that um, he abhorred hero worship and, and saw hero worship as actually quite a dangerous thing to do. But but it occurred to me then uh, uh, that it's still important nevertheless to, to have our heroes. And then it struck me as I've been thinking about that since that actually the thing about John Stott is that he was a hero precisely because he hated hero worship and uh, would not believe flattery and was very suspicious of um, himself as being someone who, who uh, it left to their own devices, might um, uh, sort of seek too much of it. He certainly uh, would not want to do that. And his humility was by no means an act of false modesty. It was very much what uh, he was himself. And I think that it's in part because he knew himself as well as knowing God. Uh, now, the service was full of, uh, and rightly, of the many things that he had done and the impact that he's had globally, not least in the majority world, the intellectual credibility he brought to uh, the Christian faith, to his writing, his integration of life and faith. And, um, and that was absolutely right and proper, but it was good uh, in Chris Wright's tour that the focus was very much on uh, what he himself modelled on the Lord Jesus and the cross of Christ particularly. And all the, the, the power, the impact, the vision that he had grew out of his own personal uh, faith and convictions about the gospel. And uh, it was just thrilling to be reminded of that and just to see that that was a thread that ran throughout his life. A few years ago I was down to, to preach at the 9.30 service um, at All Souls, and he was doing the 11.30. I think he, he got to the stage where doing two sermons in a row on a, on a Sunday morning was too much. And he, um, we were doing the same passage, but my talk was part of a family service, so inevitably it was a very different uh, talk for a sort of all-age audience and so on. And I had, I think, quite a bit of fun in the talk. I seem to remember um, having my son hide under a, a table in the middle of the talk. Anyway, I bumped into Uncle John in the vestry uh, in between services and I was sort of clearing up and he was getting ready to, to go for the next one. And uh, I just sort of said to him, Uncle John, I, I bet uh, you won't be using the illustrations that I used in my talk this morning. And uh, quick as a flash, with that classic stop twinkle in his eye, he looked straight at me and says, I don't believe in illustrations. Well, that completely put me in my place and I knew... <laughs> knew uh, wh wh what was what after that. But the interesting thing is, I actually have here an illustration that he did use. And uh, it was given to me as um, his flat was being cleared out a few years back uh, when he was moving to the retirement home just south of London that he spent the last four years at. And um, this is a, a, a leather-bound book here it is, and as you can see from the front, uh, it's uh, on the spine and on the cover. It says, John R. W. Stott, The Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. And then at the bottom, it says, Volume 82 of Many. And uh, it's uh, beautifully made and uh, in very good nick. And uh, you open it up and come to the first page. And we find those great words from the Apostle John, from John's first letter. 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So there it is on page one. And then you turn the page again and you find it's blank. And in fact, the whole thing is blank. All the way through. Right until you get to the very end. And on the last page, we find these words. All has been said that needs to be said. All has been written that needs to be written. All has been done that needs to be done. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4.16 And the wonderful thing is, is that not only now is he approaching the throne of grace in prayer, he's actually doing it physically and in full uh, reality. But this actually gets to the heart of who he was and what he understood by the Christian message. Because he was a man who knew what to do with his own fallenness. He, he knew what it was to be tempted. He, he knew what it was to fail. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people are surprised by that. It was a man with, uh, who had such an incredibly productive, effective, and in some ways successful life. And yet he knew firsthand what it was to deal with one's own personal failures before God. And uh, he would come to God dependently to trust him for what the gospel offers, forgiveness and a clean slate and a future hope of purity with him. And uh, so what this book represents is uh, something that he, he taught us many, many times to do, and it's something that he did himself, which was very simple, very straightforward, daily to bewail our sin and daily to adore our Saviour. A reality and a wonderful hope. The reality of knowing ourselves, the wonderful hope that comes from knowing God. And so whenever I look at this and I see this on my shelf every day, I'm reminded of that again daily to bewail my sin and daily to adore my Saviour, because that is the heart of the Christian message. That's the heart of what made uh, Uncle John tick and made his ministry so effective and integrated. And so I find this a great encouragement, and I hope you will too.